Hello, friends, and welcome to my Bible study class. Uh, let's look at the title for our class. The title of our class is Power Without Equal. Okay, and uh, the key verse is coming from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 29. And I'll read it first from the King James Version, and then I'll read it from the NIV. <laughs> okay, here's how it goes in the King James Version, verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. The NIV says, he gives strength to the weary, and increases the power of the weak. Amen. Okay. And uh, next what we're going to do is we're going to worship with our worship song. title of that is uh, Million Little Miracles. And it's a pre-recorded song. Y'all can sing along if you'd like.
I can't even, I can't even count them all One, two, three, four I can't even count them all Hallelujah! <laughs> I can't even, I can't even count them all One, two, three, four I can't even count them all Hallelujah! Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer Father, we thank you and we praise you for you are an awesome God. Father, you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to your power that works within us. Father, we thank you for this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. Thank you, Father, for food on our table, clothes on our back, shoes on our feet, a roof over our head. Thank you that you're a doctor in the sick room, a lawyer in the courtroom. Thank you that you make a way even where there seem it to be no way. Thank you, Father, that you are in complete control of every situation and every circumstance in our life, Lord. So we come to you casting all our cares upon you, Lord. For you have promised us in your word, you'll never leave us, you will never forsake us, you go with us all the way even unto the end of the world. Thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper, and that every tongue that rises up against us in judgment thou will condemn. For that is the privilege of the servant of the Lord, for his righteousness is from you. Thank you, Father, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thank you, Lord, for every good and perfect gift comes from the Father on high, in whom there is no variableness of changing. Thank you that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And Father, I come to you for my Bible study. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Uh, and I pray that you guard the words of my mouth to say only those things that are edifying and glorifying to your people, Father, come against every principality and power of hell. We bind it up and we command it to leave in Jesus' name. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen and amen. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, let us go to the introduction for our class. Okay. God's greatness is a subject, a theme of literary works, sermons, biblical studies, music, and the arts among his people. When we describe the people and their accomplishments, the word great refers to being preeminent above the norm or distinguished. Additionally, great implies that one's character is noticeably superior to others. Describing God as great sets him distinguishably far apart from humanity and all his creation. The Bible is replete with evidence that God possesses superior character qualities, great love, faithfulness, patience, and immeasurable power. Wow! Let me repeat that. <laughs> the Bible is replete with evidence that God possesses superior character qualities, great love, faithfulness, patience, and immeasurable power. 
The human mind cannot fully fathom God's greatness. Its multiple attributes are unsearchable and beyond the limits of human understanding. I always tell people, <laughs> sometimes it blows my mind what God can do. <laughs> and we'll come to that in the scriptures, okay? Those who learn more about how God has revealed himself in his word will more clearly understand how to respond to his greatness. Appropriately and confidently trust God while waiting for him to act on our behalf. Isaiah relayed this message to the Jewish remnant who are facing a long, challenging future. Their conquerors' victories had tempted some to falsely believe that the pagan gods were superior to the God of Israel. Oh, how horrible! <laughs> In Isaiah 40, the prophet offers a reminder of God's greatness, encouraging trust in God's promises of deliverance and restoration following the exile in Babylon. Hallelujah! And how many of you understand that Satan does his best to try and deceive us? <laughs> I'll give you a good example of uh, some 30 years ago when I lost my job at Roper Corporation. And, uh, uh, you know, I had never been unemployed for a, even a day of my life. Here I am facing unemployment. And then right across from me, where we were living in Chickamauga, was this guy, and I'm not going to name his name, because I, if he's listening, I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, and he was uh, <laughs> in the drug business. Actually, he was selling drugs from his homes. And he had uh, a new, brand new car, he was riding a Harley Davidson $30,000 motorcycle. <laughs> and, you know, I love motorcycles, by the way. Uh, don't tell that to anybody. <laughs> and he lived in a nice house with a large screen TV. And every couple of years, he got himself a new wife. <laughs> and here I am. Uh, and I'm thinking, God, I've served you. All my life, I paid my tithes. I've been obedient to the best of my knowledge. And here I am, jobless, without a job. What's going on, Lord? It looks like the enemy is winning. <laughs> but that is just sheer deception. Because years later, I know that guy totally wrecked his life. And uh, it, it was a complete disaster. It ended up in a complete disaster, okay? All right, so Satan does his level best to try and deceive us with things like that, okay? All right, let's look at the biblical context. Um, the book of Isaiah takes its name from its author, the prophet Isaiah. He was a royal prophet. He was a prophet to the king. <laughs> Isaiah prophesied during the reign of four of Judah's kings. Aha! We were just talking about that. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Tradition states that Isaiah met his death during the reign of Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, one of the nation's most evil kings. Isaiah received and accepted the call to prophetic ministry in the year of King Uzziah's death. He prophesied for approximately 55 to 60 years to a nation that consistently disobeyed the Lord. The people of Judah had foolishly turned their backs on God and 
alienated themselves from him, thus creating the need for Isaiah's pronouncements of judgment in the hope that they would repent and return to him. The overarching scheme, uh, theme of Isaiah's book is the Lord's salvation mirroring his name's meaning, salvation of Yahweh. Structurally, the text of Isaiah can be divided into two distinct segments. The judgment of God, judgment of God on Judah and surrounding nations, see chapters 1 through 39, and, quote unquote, the deliverance of God, see chapters 40 through 66. The book's theological signif uh, significance is the comprehensive prophetic picture it portrays of Jesus Christ, encompassing the full scope of his, uh, of his life as the promised Messiah. Finally, the book's practical messages, uh, message to believers is that despite their spiritual failures, God still offers cleansing from sin to all who will turn from sin and accept him. Hallelujah! What an awesome God. All right. Uh, let's go to the analysis of the biblical text, okay? We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 40, 12 through 13, and verses 25 through 26. All right, so let's do that. All right, here we go. God's greatness, incomparable omnipotence, and omniscience. Before we read the scriptures, let's try to understand what the word omnipotence is or omnipotent. Omnipotent or omnipotence means all powerful. That's what that word means, okay? Now, what does the word omniscience mean? Um, the word omniscience means all knowing. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the past, the present, and he knows also the future. Aha! All right, let's read, read the scriptures. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Away the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Uh, verses 25 and 26. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Hallelujah! If this don't blow your circuits... I don't know what will. Do you know how many stars are there in the heavens? <laughs> They're uncountable. They're more numerous than the grains of sand in the sea. <laughs> okay? Uh, and, 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 and what does he do? Uh, who created all these stars? He did. God did. <laughs> he spoke this word, this world into existence. Ex nihilo which means he made something out of nothing. The earth was void and without form, and God spoke and said, Let there be. <laughs> he flung the stars, and they flew. Wow, if that don't blow your circuits, I don't know what would. 
and he brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. You have to stretch back and say, say only a God could do that. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And just think about this. If he can do that with the stars, how much does he care about you and about me? Amen. All right. Okay, let's, let's uh, uh, dig into these scriptures and, and see what they're talking about, okay? So... There is a span of approximately 150 years between the events of Isaiah's chapters, Isaiah chapters 39 and 40. The historical time frame for Isaiah's prophecies in chapters 40 through 66 is the Babylonian exile and the post-exilic period. Isaiah was speaking to his generations, to his generation in chapter 1 through 39, and focused on God's power to defend them against the Assyrians, their enemies. Isaiah's message points forward to Jerusalem's destruction, the conquest of Judah by the Babylonians, and the events leading up to the people's restoration to their homeland, beginning with chapter 40. Some of Isaiah's audience lost their perspective about God's ability to deliver them as they contemplated the victories of Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Many imagined that the Israelites' defeat indicated that their enemies' gods were more powerful than theirs. Isaiah emphasized God's greatness and refuted this erroneous assumption using a series of rhetorical questions. In verse 12, Isaiah stressed that God requires no assistance to create the universe. He created the entire universe all by himself. Figuratively, Isaiah portrays God as so great that he holds all the earth's water in his hand and measures the vast starry universe with its breadth. Isaiah continues by proclaiming that all the earth's dust is in his basket and that he weighs the mountains and hills on small scales compared to his vastness. Next, the prophet points to God's incomparable omniscience in verse 13. No one in the world taught God anything, neither did he require consultants to gain knowledge because he possesses it all. God is so great that he cannot be compared to anything. No one in the world is his equal. He knows and controls everything about his creation and has named every star among the multiple millions that he created, verses 25 through 26. God knew where Israel was, had infinite knowledge of their situation, and knew when he would fulfill his promises. Isaiah's message is relevant to us during these Adverse and unsettling times. God knows where we are. He knows everything about us, even the number of hairs on our head. See Psalms 139, Luke 12 and 7. Even the hairs on our head are numbered by God. That just doesn't mean that he knows I have 500 hairs or 1,000 hairs, but he knows which one is hair number one, hair number two, and number three, and so on. He knows them in intimate detail. All the hairs on our head are numbered by him. 
Therefore, it is our responsibility to meditate on His infinite knowledge, trust His power and faithfulness to His promises, and acknowledge His unequaled greatness. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! What do you think? How does God's omniscience assure and challenge your relationship with Him? He knows everything. He knows our down-sitting and our uprising. Even before we speak, He knows what's on our heart. God does not see as man sees, but God looks at the heart. Amen? So everything is laid before him, laid bare before him. And so we cannot hide anything from him. We cannot pull the wool over his eyes, so to speak. Amen? And because of his omniscience, he knows our past, he knows our present, and he knows our future. That challenges our relationship with him. That demands an awesome respect and awe, a fear of the living God. Hallelujah! All right, let's go on. God's greatness, vigilant omnip uh, omnipresence, Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. Okay, so let's move on. Here we go. Isaiah 40, 27 through 31. And I'm reading from the King James Version, okay? Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Verse 28. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! <laughs> if that don't float your boat, I don't know what would. Your wood's wet, if that don't light a fire. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's, let's look at these scriptures and dig deep into them and see what they're talking about, okay? In this section, Isaiah continues reminding the people that the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God of the universe was well aware of and concerned about their adverse circumstances. Aha. Uh -huh. Why? Because he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows the past. He knows the present. He knows the future. And he's omnipresent, which means he can be present everywhere at the same time. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yet in their weariness, the remnant complained that God had lost sight of them and that the prayers for justice were unheard and unanswered. Verse 27. Some felt that they were in such a tangled mess that God couldn't see them. Thus it was useless to plead their cause. Isaiah's response was to question whether they had lost sight of the Creator's eternal nature 
who is incapable of fatigue in caring about them. Verse 28. As the everlasting God, he understands the beginning from the end and is the source of strength for all who look to him. Although the young and the strong become tired and fall, the eternal, everywhere present God does not lose strength. However, those who look to God for their every need, waiting by faith, will experience an exchange of weakness, renewal, for the power he made up available. Aha! Again, employing figurative language, Isaiah concludes this encouraging message with three results of confidently waiting on God's deliverance. First, those choosing, choosing to wait will, like the eagle, relying on the wind currents to soar, Conserve their strength by allowing him to direct their paths. Second, they will be able to maintain their faith as they daily walk with him. Finally, exclusively trusting him will enable those who wait to endure and persevere without becoming weary like an unconditioned runner. These words of encouragement were given to a discouraged remnant of Israel but can be applied to every believer. They challenge us to rely on God's unequaled power by faith instead of our strength when confronted with adversity and unexpected challenges. Wow. Here's a question. What do you think? What spiritual disciplines can we use to live like we believe that God is omnipresent and cares about what happens to us. What spiritual disciplines? Okay, obviously the spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, reading, and more importantly, studying of God's Word. Amen? Uh, uh, living a, a simple life instead of a very ostentatious life. Amen? Um, because the Bible says godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Amen? And not godliness plus great, great gain equals contentment. Amen? And those are some of the spiritual disciplines we need to live by of walking in faith and trust of God. Okay, here's a closing thought. Isaiah spoke these words to a generation repeatedly warned to repent or face exiles approaching punishment in Babylon. Today we may feel threatened by worsening moral conditions and become convinced that God is unaware of or unconcerned with our prayers for help. This lesson's encouraging message is that the Creator is very much aware and will act according to His timing on our behalf. Hallelujah! Timing is everything, amen? We can't, we can't rush God. We can't manipulate God. That's why the Scripture says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Patiently wait. Amen? Uh, while we wait for him to move, our responsibilities are to renew our trust in his, in his incomparable greatness as we stand firm in his promises, exercising patient hope that he will come through for us. Hallelujah! If to stand firm on the promises of God, because the Bible says all the promises of God are yea and amen. Yes, and so be it. And there are hundreds and thousands of promises. Amen. All our children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of, the, peace of our children. 
I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Amen. And so on and so forth. Okay. And for that, we need to have the discipline of memorizing scriptures. Uh, so while we wait for him to move, our responsibilities are to renew our trust in his incomparable greatness as we stand firm in his promises, exercising patient hope that he will come through for us. All things are possible to them who believe. <laughs> Amen. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, that is exactly what will happen. Now, how much faith do you need? <laughs> as small as a tiny mustard seed. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, uh, we're running out of time now, so um, let's just go ahead and um, finish this, okay? Internalize Isaiah 40 and 31. Adopt it in your daily meditation and challenge. Adversity in life is inevitable. But God sustains his people through trouble by his strength. Jesus himself said, In this world, you will have tribulation. Thank God he didn't stop there. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah! And because he has overcome, we can overcome too. I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens me? Waiting on the Lord is an active process in developing, maintaining an intimate and obedient relationship with Him. It's not a passive process. It's not where you just sit back on your sofa, relax, uh, you know, in your comfort zone. No. No. Okay? Waiting on the Lord is an active process in developing and maintaining an intimate and obedient relationship with him. Help us, Lord. Those who trust in the Lord can experience his unequaled omnipotence and comforting omnipresence to sustain them in life's circumstances. There are discouraged and hurting believers and others who have yet to accept Christ as a Savior. They all need the message of hope that Isaiah shared with the Jewish remnant, despairing and doubting God's care for them. As you receive renewed strength by personalizing his message of hope, prayerfully commit to proclaiming it to those whom God leads you to encounter this week. We have to redeem the time for the days are evil. Lord, help us to redeem the time for the days are evil. Hallelujah. Here's a closing prayer. Gracious, loving Father, thank you for the message of comfort and encouragement that your inexhaustible power is readily available, available to those who place their trust in you. Help us share this message with others through our witness for you in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. And we'll continue with that worship song, Miracle, Million Little Miracles. I can't even, I can't even count them all. I can't even, I can't even count them all. I can't even, I can't even count them all. One, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. 
your miracles one two three four I can't even count them all got miracles on miracles a million little miracles miracles on miracles count your miracles one two three four I can't even count them all Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening. And if you like my broadcast, please put likes uh, so uh, and share with others of your friends so more people will get to hear this, okay? Thank you. And if you have any prayer requests, please mention them in the comments or mention them in Messenger, okay? Um, and uh, when you're listening uh, li on live, uh, make sure you let us know what city you're listening from, okay? Thank you and God bless you.